we are all simply spiraling through life. Be it through pretentious or pompous filmmakers, they allow us to walk through a screen and experience a path paved by someone else for once. So with how accurate The Fablements was to Steven Spielberg's own life, it's a path worth taking. But let's go over some fact versus fictions for this formidable film. So no map or compass is needed to find out that this movie is almost a one-to-one -one retelling of Spielberg's adolescence. Yet not wanting to seem vain or self-obsessed, it's not called a biopic and isn't sold as one either. He truly wants his story to be a mold that we can place our own experiences into. For the sake of conversation though, let's refer to the people in his life by their real names. So here's a quick rundown. Sammy is of course Spielberg himself. Paul Donald leaves his Gotham bombing days behind to play Burt Fableman or Sammy's dad, or Arnold in real life. Missy, his mom in real life, is named Leah. His sisters in descending age are Anne, Nancy, and Sue, respectfully. His uncle weirdly keeps the same name in the move over to film. And Sammy's meeting with John Ford was with the actual man named John Ford. But we'll get to that part later. I think there's a special relationship between man and ape. A small existential difference keeps us from truly knowing what lie beyond their eyes. But through them we see a warped sense of reflection. They are both our closest relative yet most alien ally against the darkness of non-sentience. This may be why so many wealthy and creative people opt to get some kind of primate as a pet. See as a boy, Steven's mother brought home a capuchin monkey because as she puts it, I needed a laugh. It's not provable, but this interaction could have been what gives him the idea to use a monkey in Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I wish I could say this was the same monkey used in previous Spielberg works to bring this all home. But she was Dexter in the Night of the Museum franchise, so that's pretty A-list as monkeys go. Honoring your heritage can be difficult when your creativity and paycheck rely on the whims of the general public. Fablements does both by being a film anyone and everyone can enjoy while telling the story of a young Jewish artist slowly growing into the groundbreaking director we know and love as Steven Spielberg. Even before Schindler's List and his appearance in Eight Crazy Nights, the Spielberg family was celebrating and honoring Judaism in their lives. Going beyond what we see in the movie, his mother would go on to create a kosher restaurant in LA called the Milky Way, which is still open and running today. Stop by if you can, I heard they're incredible. Later in life, Spielberg would start two charities, the USC Shoah Foundation Institute and the Righteous Persons Foundation, to collect and preserve Holocaust survivor stories and support Jewish communities in the US respectfully. The first point against the film in this video is Steven's crisis of faith over being a director. It's absolutely true he started questioning himself around the age of 16. But the reason the movie gives is a little off the mark. In 1962, the young Steven went to see a little known movie called Lawrence of Arabia. If you didn't know, the blockbuster film is a romanticized story about the British officer Thomas Edward Lawrence leading a revolt against Turkish forces in World War I. A notable page in cinema history for sure. It made Alec Guinness a household name long before Star Wars cemented it in culture forever. But it almost ruined Spielberg's career before it started. As he said in an HBO documentary, when the film was over I wanted to not be a director anymore because the bar was just too high. So obsessed with the movie he would go back week after week for three weeks straight. A big plus for the movie is the accurate portrayal of his parents. His mother was indeed an extremely talented concert pianist and painter in life. Her profoundly productive parenting allowed each child to grow and experience life through their own creative lenses, much like how she saw the world. Her story started in the 1920s and 30s, learning piano from her local music conservatory. She met her future husband Arnold and only went on one date before the breakout of World War II, after which she would marry him and have have four kids together. And that's where the Fablemans catch up with her story, because the movie is primarily focused on Steven's headspace, and much of her story is tied to her famous son. While she is now sadly passed, she lived a full life filled with adventure and experimentation. And the movie does well to portray the meteoric impact she had on her son's life, breathing life into his creative spark. On the subject of creative sparks, there is an old saying that you should never meet your heroes. That proverb rings sour in the ear of Spielberg though because of his interaction with John Ford. A turn of the century director with a penchant for westerns and an adaptation of Grapes of Wrath under his belt, the meeting is replicated almost entirely in the movie. Not a word or movement missing or added for any benefit. Even his helpful picture painting tip of horizon lines. What was that all about? We were probably all in young 15 year old Steven's shoes wondering 
wondering what he meant by that. Well, with a little deep diving, here's his point. The horizon can act as a tool for the overall struggles for those in the composition. When the horizon line bisects every frame, it's simply a backdrop to the actions in the movie. But when you can be dynamic with it, when you can use artistry in directing, you can be a good picture maker. Another entry that's a little complicated. Leah did leave Arnold for his friend Bernie Adler, a nightmare scenario for anyone in a relationship. And it's true Stephen found out because he caught them by accident. But like anyone dealing with love and affection as an adult, the real scenario was a bit more complicated. Stephen's parents were both young when they met. They married not too long after that too. People grow and change and sometimes you simply want something else. Their mismatching personalities didn't help their cause either. But the real difference to this event was Steven's reaction. Like stated before, he wasn't so distraught that he wanted to give up directing. And over time, he's come to understand the situation a lot better. Because much like Sean Spencer, he mistakenly blamed his father. Arnold purposely let his children believe he was at fault for the separation because he didn't want them to blame their mother. This leads us nicely to Steven's father, Arnold Spielberg. Being the son of Jewish Ukrainian immigrants, growing up, Arnold shared his son's passion for telling stories, but his greater passion passion was for tinkering. He got his first radio at 12 and thus began a long love affair with technology. He joined the war effort after Pearl Harbor as a radio operator because of course he did. He would marry the pianist he'd been writing with in 1945 and a year later out popped Steven. After his graduation in 49, Arnold got jobs all over the country due to his involvement with early computer technology with GE and the likes. Which explains why Spielberg had a hard time making roots anywhere. But that only furthered Arnold Arnold's presence and effect in the tech world. Living to the ripe old age of 103, Arnold was a juggernaut of electrical engineering. And you can't help but wonder if his knack for tinkering rubbed off on his eldest son, whose movies were on the cutting edge of cinematography, animatronics, and computer graphics at a time when such a thing would be impossible. Another faithful aspect of Spielberg's life is his beloved 8mm camera. What will inevitably become a museum piece the likes of Indiana Jones would die for, this small basic film camera was given to him by his dad at the age of 9. His short flick called The Last Gunfight is what some can call a humble beginning. The first ever movie filmed on this camera is the direct answer to such iconic films like Jaws and E.T. But what is an 8mm camera? Cast your mind back to a time where film was a physical item and frankly rates were as high as 16 fps and these days the more with the film reels had the lighter the image captured this gauge was measured in millimeters we've since left the physical world behind and used digital recording but there are still those out there who will pick up an 8 millimeter and tap into a river of tradition and experience Reds, blues, and yellows all mixing together under a giant tent. The smell of peanuts wafts through the air like the elegant creatures going from bar to bar in front of you. You taste popcorn and sweet candy cotton mix in your mouth like a salty sweet parade. In front of you, a really well-dressed man yells through a bullhorn and your blood starts feeling like lightning. This is the circus. And it's the subject of the first movie Spielberg ever saw. Released in 1952, The Greatest Show on Earth depicts the lives of those living and working in the Ringling Bros. Barnum and Bailey Circus, a movie that has a direct link to the real life Spielberg. The Fablemans capture this moment beautifully. Little Steven's awe and wonder mirrors what millions of children have felt watching his films now. Plus, the movie has a young Charlton Heston in a leather jacket and fedora. A get up we'll see Steven emulate decades later in a little indie film you may have never heard of. Another truism in the film was his obsession with smashing his model trains. Of course, it's not as simple as that. In The Greatest Show on Earth, there's a horrible train crash and that image gets stuck in his head as he puts it he was traumatized by it so he got his little eight millimeter camera and filmed his train crashing over and over recreating it over and over until he got it just right making it look just like the one he saw in the movie so while this footage will never be seen again it does hold a little connection to the start of blockbuster movies as a whole there's an urban legend that at the 1896 premiere of arrival of a train the crowd rushed out believing that the train was coming straight for them it is in fact false but isn't it cool one of the earliest movie sensations shares a similar story with him? Yes, yes, I know. He has three sisters. The movie got that right. But like a lot of siblings, it would be unfair to leave them in his shadow forever. We can often forget that siblings of famous people are people themselves with complex lives and emotions. Not to mention, if you simply wish, to see them as extra DNA from the parents. Siblings have a huge effect on how the others are raised. 
Starting with Anne Spielberg, almost as well known as her older brother, you may recognize her from that magical realism movie Big. She co-wrote the damn thing. Steven wasn't the only one with a knack for a camera, because Nancy has since become a producer herself. A good one at that, at least good enough to make her older brother cry with Above and Beyond. Sue followed her own path away from the silver screen and is an independent marketer. It's nice to see such a successful family that is still so close. I like to warn all those who are watching now that we briefly talk about anti-semitism and anti-semitic violence. If you're sensitive to that topic, feel free to skip. A big thing in the lives of all of the Spielbergs that the movie captures is the anti-semitism they experienced in life. From state to state, anti-semitic sentiment seemed to follow them like the plague. A famous story is once as a child, Stephen witnessed his neighbors chanting on the lawn, the Spielbergs are dirty Jewish people. This environment was evil and luckily they moved out not long after. But not before young Stephen snuck out of the house to smear peanut butter all over their windows. He also suffered the same treatment at school, coming home often with a bloody nose or black eye, making him feel ashamed of his Jewish heritage. But it's nice to see that after all of those hardships, he still ended up being as successful as he is. The movie does ring true that he made fun of his abusers, and he even approached Steven like he did in The Fablements. The only difference here is why. No tears were shed in real life. The real wasp waste of time thought it was funny and said he wished he knew more about Steven. Still a victory in our books, but these early memories never leave a person. Not really. Just look into his Indiana Jones series where Nazis are foiled by their own greed and evil at every turn. Or more on the nose, Schindler's List. Which while yes follows a literal member of the SS, shows just how repulsive and heinous the entire movement was. That seems to be a running theme, small events slowly grow in one's mind until we start seeing the mountains behind the molehill, finding deeper truths in what were at first small moments. This is the first really egregious example of something being made up whole cloth. See like anyone Spielberg didn't start with dolly zooms and tracking shots. His cinematography grew and matured with him, and that early stuff was far from the cinematic genius we see before us today. And that's a problem. Sure, we all understand that on a fundamental level, but when you're watching a movie, you want to see these epic stories unfold. So in order to appeal to a more general audience, production had to stage a better version of history, where Spielberg was as good as he would be. Not that he wasn't a talented youth, but the extent you see in the movie is a tad exaggerated in comparison. But if this movie inspires a small child out there to emulate Sammy, then who are we to rob them of that experience? A little bit of a cheat is involved in the next one, mostly because at one point they just used the actual real thing to replicate it. I'm talking about the wardrobe and accessories in the movie. We can sort of lose sight in how much work goes into period acting costume. It doesn't help when people can wear the same outfit for decades, not listening to overarching fashion trends. But for the Fablemans, they work closely with the Spielbergs milking all possible memories of what their parents wore then. At one point they got their hands on the actual earrings that Leah wore, but they were too distracting on camera, so it got replaced with a turquoise themed pair to still honor her fashion taste. And in a wonderful story of coincidence, while poring over photos of Arnold, the team noticed a particularly striking bolo tie, a tie that someone just happens to also have. Serendipity strikes again. The movie does a very good job depicting the family's timeline moving from place to place. Due to Arnold's profession, the Spielbergs made an adolescent long trip from the northeast of Ohio to the promised land in West Phoenix, Arizona. Okay, maybe not the shiny Hollywood tale we're used to, but we're shooting for accuracy here, not dramatics. Not that this isn't lacking some kind of metaphorical subtext. One could see his slow march west as him getting closer and closer to Hollywood, where he'll eventually find his fame and fortune. But until then, our future Oscar winner will have to stay in Arizona. Speaking of Phoenix, because this is the climatic end to the moving saga, the director's memories and drawings of his childhood were taken extra seriously, making sure every room and scene felt and looked like the rooms and moments in his life, going so far as to have Spielberg himself draw the storyboard in his room. It wasn't done as a cheap easter egg though. Apparently he has been drawing and doing storyboards the exact same way since he was a teen. But the realism here is a limited resource, because there is something wrong in Arizona. People are a little too nice. In real life, the anti Semitism never really let up from those early days and Phoenix was no exception to that rule. There really was an Uncle Boris, but Spielberg only met him once and he couldn't really understand what he was saying due to his thick accent. Plus the man wasn't an actor but a circus performer. I get that they changed it to connect to Spielberg's later work, but he has direct inspiration from a circus movie. I mean that could have been the through line. 
Now finally his first ever real movie. We will never be able to see it unfortunately, but here are some facts about it. His father helped fund it with an entire budget of $500. 500 people ended up paying a dollar to see it, but at the end of the day he only had a $1 profit. Not bad when you consider no home movie any of us have made have made a cent so far. The lights turning back on, so the film must be over. Thank you for sitting in and exploring this Oscar winner's history with us. I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I'm gonna go binge some Spielberg movies.